protist worksheet. So this is for lab, chapter 20, protists. And you all will recall that we handed out a protist, or we will hand out a protist um, worksheet. So I thought I would try to go over some of this information in the worksheet. And um, what we're going to do, let's see here, we'll take a look at, at the fir first page. So folks will be having you, um, as a team of four, check out both a micro A box and a micro B box, because we'll be looking at lots of prepared slides. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and folks, you might recall that protists are eukaryotes, which are neither plants nor fungi nor animals. Um, it's a kind of a dumping ground, as it was originally described. Um, at one time there was a kingdom, protista, but after DNA sequencing evolved, it was discovered that this kingdom, protista, it was so diverse. There was such a great variety of organisms in it. It really shouldn't be called a kingdom anymore. So we'll just use the term protist with a little p. And you'll recall that we had said that um, initially biologists had tried to classify protists as animal-like, which we would call protozoa, or plant-like, which we would call algae. And indeed, there are protists that are fungal-like, the slime molds and water molds. But we're going to focus almost entirely on some examples of protozoa, animal-like protists. So is animals, um, there are chemoheterotrophs. Many of them are motile. Not all of them are motile, but many are. Um, they often have a form of ingestive nutrition, um, just like we, we animals, us animals. They lack cell walls. Um, so these are all animal-like characteristics. So what we'll do is in this audio, we'll talk about some of the free-living um, protists, the euglena, which is truly cool. It, it's a modal, it has a flagella, but what makes it wild is it's what's called a mixotroph. Um, in the sunlight, it uses its chloroplast to carry out photosynthesis, but in the dark, it, it can act as a, a hunter. It's a chemoheterotroph. Um, it can um, engulf, eat other microbes. So this is a really cool organism. And then we'll also be looking at a, a free-living ciliate called paramecium. This is a protozoan probably a lot of you saw um, in school previously. And then we'll, we'll look at an example of a free-living amoeba, amoeba proteus. And these guys are really cool because they use these um, extensions of the cytoplasmic membrane called pseudopods to move and to eat. And then what we'll do in the second or third video is we'll look at some of the symbiotic um, protozoa. And there's quite a few of them. A number of them are pathogens. So we'll break the symbiotic um, protozoa into maybe two additional audios. Okay, so I think what we'd like to do in this video then is we're going to move through the slides or the pages rather so that we can hit upon our free living um, protozoa. So we'll start here with um, amoeba proteus. All right, so um, you'll be looking in your micro B box at slides 23 and 24. And, and folks, I apologize because some of, some of the um, boxes, they have amoeba that have been stained with these bright, almost fluorescent colors of like turquoise and pink and yellow. Um, realize that amoeba in nature are going to be colorless, right? So if they have color, it's either from something they've eaten or it's because they've been stained. So with amoeba, um, as with all of our protozoa, they're unicellular, a single cell, and they lack a cell wall, another animal-like property. They have these cool cytoplasmic extensions called pseudopods or false feet, and there's two functions of the pseudopods. They're um, used for motility, so the pseudopods permit the amoeba to, to literally crawl over a solid surface. But the second function is they're used in the process called phagocytosis. So let's say, we, we could just pretend maybe this is a little food particle right here. The amoeba could um, attach to this food particle and then um, form pseudopods to surround the food particle. And then the pseudopods would fuse, forming what's called a food vacuole. And then subsequently, hydrolytic enzymes would be dumped into the food vacuole from the amoeba's lysosomes and the food would be digested. <coughs> Excuse me. So if I asked you for two functions of the pseudopods, you could say motility and also food acquisition or phagocytosis. Well, hopefully we're gonna have a model in the lab 
um, and it would be fair for us to ask you on the lab exam to identify some structures. So you'd want to be able to identify the nucleus, and again, that's going to contain the chromosomal DNA, the genetic information. You'd want to identify the pseudopods. And then in lab, we'll be able to see, hopefully on um, the model, it'll be easier to see, there's these really cool structures called contractile vacuoles. And the purpose of the contractile vacuoles is to pump out excess water so the amoeba won't explode from osmotic lysis if they're leaving, living in a hypoosmotic environment. We'll have um, live cultures of amoeba. Hopefully they will be alive. They're very delicate. They often die. But if we're lucky enough to make a wet mount and see live amoeba, you'll see the contractile vacuole get bigger and bigger and bigger, and all of a sudden it seems to disappear. And that's because it's contracted and pumped the excess water out of the, out of the, cell, the cells. Um, so with amoeba, just in, in general, they like to live in fresh water, um, usually oxygen-rich environment. They're very delicate, as we say, in our cultures. They often end up dying, so don't spend too much time try, trying to find them in our cultures because very often they're dead. They don't like light, which I, I didn't realize before. So in ponds, for example, they might be found on the underside of lily pads. Apparently they like to live under the lily pads. They don't like, they don't like light. And um, I found a recipe to try to grow some amoeba from like pond material. So we'll see if we can't get an amoeba culture growing in lab. Um, they can form tough cysts when environmental conditions get tough. They can form a tough cyst. Size range is usually two to 300 micrometers. And, um, and then there is a upper limit of about 500 micrometers. So in theory, we might be able to see these guys even with a dissecting scope. Um, let me see here, and I think that's going to be it for our amoeba proteus. Um, in following videos, um, we'll talk about a pathogenic disease-causing member of this group of amoeba, and that's an entamoeba histolytica that's going to cause amoebic dysentery. So um, we'll do that video separately. All right, now let's see if we can go hunting and find another free-living. Okay, these are... Um, Giardia and Trypanosoma are pathogens, so we won't talk about them yet. Trypanosomes are pathogens. We'll talk about those in the next video. Oh, these little guys are so cool. So we'll finish up, folks, on, on this page where we have two additional free-living protozoa. And this is one of my favorites. This is Euglena. So Euglena is going to be in the micro B box, um, slide 25 and 26. Also, we'll have live cultures of Euglena. So I hope you all will get a chance to make a wet mount because they're just absolutely gorgeous. So um, Euglena are called mixotrophs. And you might think, what the heck is that? So it turns out Euglena in evolutionary history probably started out as protozoa, animal-like protists. Um, they're hunters. Yeah, they can hunt other microbes in their environment. Um, so in the dark, they can act as hemoheterotrophs. However, in evolutionary history, this is so cool, they ate algae, which are um, photosynthetic eukaryotes, and these algae took up housekeeping in the cytoplasm of the euglena and eventually evolved into the euglena's um, chloroplast, which is just so cool. That's called secondary endosymbiosis. Um, you might recall that we said, we talked about earlier in lecture and lab, that eukaryotic chloroplasts evolve from primitive cyanobacteria. So it's so interesting. This is kind of like the nesting dolls. So the algae acquired their chloroplasts from endosymbiotic cyanobacteria, and then the euglena acquired their chloroplasts from endosymbiotic algae. I just think that's so cool. All right, so in, in light then, euglena can switch over to being photoautotrophs. They can use photosynthesis to make their own organic molecules. So very cool organisms indeed. They have flagella. They have one long flagellum, which is what we'll usually see um, in photomicrographs. And then they have a short, stubby little flagella that doesn't extend very far. Um, they have a nucleus. They have contractile vacuoles. Um, they lack a cell wall. Um, again, which makes us think of their protozoal ancestry. Um, and then the other thing that's really cool, they have a, a surface covering of proteins, like protein plates, called a pellicle. 
And we'll see in our wet mounts that as the, um, the um, suspension of the euglena warms up um, from the light from our microscope, it drives oxygen out of the water, right? And we'll see that our euglena are going to, I think they're really suffering, right, from lack of oxygen. And they're going to start to round up. And then they're going to move almost like um, amoeba. It is so cool. And my understanding is it's, it's from these um, protein plates of the pellicle that can move over one another, and it permits the amoeba to move in a more amoeboid-like motion. To me, that always means they're getting ready to die. They're getting ready to lice. So to me, that's always a little bit sad, but very cool. So again, hopefully we'll have a model. So you'd want to be able to identify the flagellum. You'd want to be able to identify the chloroplast, excuse me, the chloroplasts, the nucleus. Oh, and another really cool thing with euglena, at the base of the flagellum, there's a red dot um, referred to as the stigma or the eye spot. And this is part of the photo detection system. Very, very cool. And indeed, you guys, um, with the euglena, if they're living in an aquatic habitat and they want to find just the right amount of light, um, they need to be able to, to detect where, where the light is. So um, using their photo detection system, they exhibit what's called phototaxis, so movement along a light gradient. Also in our wet mounts, it's so cool, the spir um, excuse me, the euglena, they're, they're moving in kind of a spiral motion through the water, and as they're turning, as they're tumbling through, occasionally you'll see a little red, red blink, 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 red blink, and that's the stigma or the eye spot. Very cool organisms. Okay, so remember in the light, they're photoautotrophs. In the dark, they're chemoheterotrophs. They call that mixotroph. Um, again, they're free-living. They aren't going to cause, um, they're not going to invade another organism and cause harm. And then the last free-living um, protozoa you guys will look at is one you're probably familiar with. This is paramecium. Um, paramecium is what's called a ciliate. It's covered with all these little short hair-like filaments that beat. Okay, so a little ciliated eukaryotic organism and the cilia are used for um, two reasons one is for motility but the other reason is that um, the cilia can be used in food acquisition so in lab we'll show a model of a paramecium and it has this invagination called the, the gullet it's kind of like the um, almost the equivalent of our throats and the the gullet is going to be lined with um, cilia that will beat and bring microbes down towards the bottom and then the food will be enclosed in a food vacuole so the paramecium carry out phagocytosis um, a lysosome will fuse with the, the food vacuole the phagosome releasing hydrolytic enzymes and then the food will be digested so paramecium they are um, chemoheterotrophs I was reading apparently there's one species of um, paramecium that has evolved a symbiosis with green algae. So the algae live in the cytoplasm and carry out photosynthesis. So I thought that was kind of neat. But for us in our lab folks, we'll classify um, paramecium as a chemoheterotroph. Um, the other thing, you guys, that's really cool with ciliates is they always have two nuclei. They have a great big nucleus called the macronucleus, and then they'll have a little, little baby nucleus called the micronucleus. And for us folks, for just our lab exam, if I ask you what's the function of the micronucleus, all you need to say is it's involved in sexual reproduction, for indeed the paramecium can reproduce either asexually by splitting in two, or they can um, exchange genetic information in a process called conjugation. So they can also perform sexual reproduction. And again, folks, all you need to know for the lab exam is the micronuclei are involved in sexual reproduction. The paramecium will also have a contractile vacuole, right? And I'm just over here looking at these words, you guys. So um, endocytosis is the process in which our um, cellular organisms bring substances into the cell within a membrane-bound vacuole. So phagocytosis is an example of endocytosis. And then this other process is the opposite. It's called exocytosis. This is how the microbes um, or the cellular organisms would get would get rid of waste. You know, after the food's digested, nutrients are absorbed. There's still waste material in that vacuole, so we'd call it a waste vacuole. And so, what the waste vacuole will do is it will migrate over to a specific area of the cell membrane and fuse with it and dump the waste material into the extracellular environment. So it's kind of like a primitive anus 
like this dedicated portion of the cell membrane um, that's used for exocytosis of getting rid of waste materials. Okay, folks, I think that's it. Right, okay, and plasmodium is another pathogenic um, protozoa, so we'll talk about those in the next video. So we'll, we'll stop this video here, and we'll do... We'll do a couple more videos um, on the symbiotic. Protestants.